What's the next major breakthrough in technology? That's the big question that clients were asking Tobias Dengel, president of Willowtree, a TELUS international company. We were in the internet wave from about 1997, 98 till 2008 or nine. We've been in this mobile wave since 2008, 2009 when the iPhone got introduced. Wow, there's an app for everything. And in trying to answer that big question of what's next, Tobias's research led to him authoring a book called The Sound of the Future, where he concludes that voice is the next big wave, as big as the internet or as big as mobile. So today on Questions for Now, we'll ask, has the time come to prioritize voice-first experiences? Welcome to Questions for Now, a podcast from TELUS International, where we ask today's big questions in digital customer experience. I'm Robert Zirk. Here's what we mean by voice technology. First, there's voice recognition, the ability for computers to interpret our speech using artificial intelligence and machine learning. When that's paired with natural language processing, the computer or device can recognize the meaning of what's being said and respond with an output to the request. Voice-first experiences have several advantages over other forms of input. Tobias noted speed as a major benefit of voice technology and cited how voice can reduce the input time a customer needs to spend making a selection out of a wide range of options. Domino's, for example, has said there's four billion combinations of pizza that you can create within Domino's. Obviously, that is super complicated and takes a while, right? It takes two or three minutes to put together a complicated pizza order on the Domino's app, whereas it would take 10 seconds to just say that order. Now you don't want to listen to the response. You just want it to develop on its own. And so really, anytime you're picking from a broad selection of things, it's always going to be faster to say it rather than type it. For many people, using voice can be a more intuitive way of communicating. A Stanford experiment found that, through voice recognition, humans could input text three times faster than they could by typing on their phone's keyboard, and error rates were lower as well. Brett Kinsella is the CEO, founder, and research director of VoiceBot.ai, which provides news and analysis on conversational and generative AI. He highlighted the significance of voice technology opening the door to a more human way of communicating with our devices. Fundamentally, this is the first time we're able to speak to computers in our language. Up to that point, all of the interaction with technology, whether it be the printing press, the car, the computer, we were always using some tool that the machine could understand in order to make the machine do something for us. With natural language processing, voice, voice first, these capabilities mean we can communicate with them like we would another person. And there are a lot of things, particularly where we might not know exactly how to ask for them. Or if we do, it might take several menus, filters, and screens just to find what it is we're looking for. U.S. Bank, Richard Weeks, who runs the application there, he's like, Brett, I have 300 features in this application. On a mobile user interface, I cannot expose 300 features in a way that people can find them. They have to use search, and wouldn't it be better if they could just ask for it and would just automatically do it? If you're doing an international money transfer, you probably need to know the SWIFT code for your bank. But there's very few people who know that that's the terminology. But you can go into Bank of America and use the Erica voice assistant, and you can say, I need to get the number that I use to do an international wire transfer. And it'll just come back on the screen. And a lot of people don't recognize like how big of an impact that is, that we can now just communicate with each other in a way that's comfortable to us and maybe provide more context than we would in the past, like we would with a human, and do that in a way that the machine then can respond to us more effectively. Voice technology can also break down language barriers between people. Real-time or slightly delayed translation is another aspect. Obviously, all of us can appreciate that from a tourism perspective, but there are many, many languages spoken in in India and Africa that have very small bases of users that have been excluded largely from the digital world that are going to be starting to participate through these technologies. It's going to allow things like customer service to happen real time um, between people that don't speak the same language. Another area where voice can be beneficial is safety. 
particularly in hands-on, heads-up applications, where your hands are busy performing a task that makes it impossible or unsafe to type a command. As an example, think of a chef who's in the middle of food prep and needs to know a cooking temperature without interrupting their workflow and changing out their gloves. But beyond food safety, the ramifications of voice can go so far as to save lives, and Tobias shared a great example from his book The Sound of the Future that illustrates how vital this technology can be. One of my favorite stories in the book is someone was driving, I think, in Iowa in 2018, and they ran off the road into a lake, and the car flipped, and their phone was just somewhere in the car. They couldn't reach it, and they just said, hey, Siri, call 911. It's the first known use of Siri in that paradigm of ultimately voice technology in, in terms of saving lives. And voice can change lives as well, creating inclusive experiences that allow people to communicate and connect in ways they weren't able to before. At Willow Tree, we launched the Vocable app, which was designed to help people who've lost the ability to speak to communicate. It uses Gen AI tools to analyze what people around them, these patients, are saying and then it presents likely responses on a screen. And by looking at the right letters and the right areas of the screen, it actually creates the responses on their behalf. And so it's just an example of how voice is going to allow members of our society that have been constrained to fully participate in the digital world. Voice technology also has the potential to transform the way we work creating greater efficiencies by using the context of information. We're working for a large beverage manufacturer and they have hundreds of thousands of vending machines and fountain systems in restaurants that get serviced. And it's when you observe how those technicians spend their time, a big chunk of it is ordering parts. They do that via either apps or from print catalogs, but it takes them 15 to 20 minutes from the time that they know they need a part to actually complete the order. And that's just a perfect voice application, right? Because we know using location data, what machine you're standing in front of. So we know the model, we know what the parts are, we know what the most likely parts are to break. And then we can analyze a voice request with an incredibly high degree of fidelity and figure out with you know, well over 99% accuracy what part it is that the technician is ordering from the field. And now you've taken a process that takes 15 to 20 minutes and you've turned it into a 10 to 20 second process. The efficiency when you have tens or hundreds of thousands of employees that are doing certain tasks of combining all this data is, it's just truly breakthrough. Brett predicted a growing number of voice assistants, or co-pilots, will revolutionize the way employees and teams manage and complete tasks. We're going to have them individually. We're going to have, I think we're going to have several. And then companies are going to have many. But there's all sorts of different types of internal assistants who are going to help anybody out there who's doing a job execute a portion of their job more effectively. So the voice technology is critical because it can understand what we're saying. Like we're saying, oh, here's an action item. Sue, you're going to do this. Bill, you're going to do that, right? Great. And then there's the assistant or the co-pilot in the background, which might summarize that so everybody knows that, might take that and put it into a to-do list or your project management system and then notify everybody about it. And it's all these things together, which I think are really extraordinary. These voice assistants can help employees get more done while making the most of the technology at their disposal. We use a lot of different applications throughout the day. It's just a fact of the world. Every one of those requires us to learn that, and we generally don't know all the features. We generally know a small subset of the features of them. Sometimes we need to work across two applications at the same time, and they're not integrated and those types of things. Wouldn't it be nice if we had an assistant that actually knew the information and the functionality of both of those systems, and we could just have it do something for us? And it just comes back to that idea. Of like If you could have your right-hand person next to you, it's just like ready to do whatever needs to be done and they can parallel process with you, and they know things you don't know and can do things you can't do. It can just listen along. You can just ask it, and it'll just put it in front of you. And meetings kind of seem mundane. And I think a lot of people understand, like, we can have meeting transcripts. and like, But now this idea that if you join a meeting five minutes late, it's got a transcript, and it's doing a summary in the sidebar for you right away, so you can catch up really quickly. You don't interrupt the flow. Like, you can catch yourself up. They don't have to stop and start over so that you have context. While there are many benefits that extend across the organization, there are also different benefits applicable specifically to different roles. For example, with the help of automation, 
Voice technology can help your sales team reduce the friction of inputting client information into a CRM. If you're having these calls and it's automatically transcribing what's going on and doing action items and identifying key people and activities that are going to take place, it can actually auto-populate that into your CRM. You don't have to worry about, you know, the sales lead had to run to the airport, so they didn't have time to put it in. And by the time they got to their desk the next day, they didn't remember part of it or something like that. It's just already there. All they have to then is go through and verify it and just say, yep, that's correct. This is correct. And just done. And it'll give them then the list of action items to follow up with them. It should actually also at the same time be like, oh, and here's a, a recent article link or a blog post that you should just send as a follow up to your client because it's relevant to something they asked about. In a customer experience setting, Brett cited agent assist technology, which can be used to gather relevant information for an agent before they get connected with a customer. Now, this co-pilot assistant would actually listen to the call in real time and just be flashing things on the screen in real time based on what they're saying. Product catalogs change, which specials change, all these other types of things. Things are specific to a customer, right? But if you've only been on the job for three, four, five months, what if you had the expert, the best performing person in the call center right next to you? It's safe to say the interest in voice technology is here. Voicebot.ai reports that in 2021, 78.4 million adults in the United States were active monthly users of voice assistants on their smartphones. And as of 2022, 94.9 million adults in the U.S. owned at least one smart speaker, with half using them on a daily basis. It's clear that voice has the potential to improve our lives in so many capacities. But if the user base is there, and voice is capable of everything we've talked about, why doesn't it seem as ubiquitous in our lives as the internet and smartphones? Tobias explained that, up to this point, we've been in the early phases of voice technology, similar to how the potential of the internet wasn't necessarily fully unlocked back in the mid-90s. So any new technology follows the paradigms of the old technology or something that people are familiar with. So the first TV shows were really just broadcasts of existing radio shows or plays, just like the early internet was really just a reconstitution of things we know. When you saw Time Magazine on AOL in 1995, it was really like a PDF. It didn't have any interactivity. It ultimately was easier to read the print magazine than look at it on AOL. And early mobile was super frustrating, right? We all had mobile devices that were clunky and difficult to use. And we all used them because we kind of got that this was going to be a big deal. But until the true user interface revolution happened in each of those cases, there wasn't the breakthrough, right? Think of how easy it is, for example, to stream video content today relative to the 90s, when watching video, if you could even find the content you wanted, would require you to jump through many hoops only to receive relatively low-quality picture and sound. Or how, as Tobias mentioned, the touchscreen popularized by the iPhone unlocked an ease of use that other inputs couldn't match. Brett noted the reality of how people have been using voice technology up to this point didn't equate to how they thought they'd use it. We have this idea of single-turn versus multi-turn conversations. A single-turn conversation is basically a command. One input, one response. You don't need to provide additional context, you just want to turn the lights in your kitchen on or off. Multi-turn conversations allow for more complex interactions that build off of the context of previous inputs or questions. And there was a lot of hype around these multi-turn conversations. You're going to talk to these assistants like they're your friend or like they're your mentor and all these things. And those applications do exist. But the vast majority of people, in fact, nine of the top 10 use cases that were adopted on smart speakers are all what we'd call single turn. It's request response. You request something, it's delivered to you. An action is executed, it gives you information, and you're done. And what the users found was this was really convenient for asking for a song, for initiating a phone call, for setting a timer, for getting the cooking temperature, like you said, for the recipe you're working on. I kind of feel like what we did with voice assistants was the hors d'oeuvre. This was like, okay, we're going to make this more accessible. We're working with natural language. Now we've got the ability for machines to do some basic reasoning, to generate things that didn't exist before. Tobias predicts that people will be much more likely to interact with multiple turns now that conversational AI is being combined with generative AI, which he refers to in the sound of the future as the ultimate interface. When you think about how 
voice is interpreted by a machine, it really has three components, right? One is natural language processing, which means can it transcribe what you're saying into words? Then the second is natural language understanding. Can it take what those words are and understand what you meant? And then the third paradigm is how does it respond to that request? People have been working on voice technology for 60 or 70 years, but over the last five to seven years, there's been a lot of advances in natural language processing and natural language understanding. But Gen AI as an underpinning really has accelerated both because in terms of transcribing what you're saying, the system does its best to figure out, all right, what did Robert say? What were the words? But there might be two or three words that are wrong. Then it runs it through a generative AI system and what's Gen AI really, really good at pattern recognition. And so it's going to say, all right, most likely based on the words around that we know what Robert said, the other word that we're not quite sure of has to be X or is a 99% chance. We're seeing that every day. Like if you look at what Siri does when you're talking, you probably have noticed that it tries to transcribe what you're saying. And then like a second or two later, it switches it up because what it's done is processed it through Gen AI in some sense. The same goes for understanding what you meant. One of the tools everyone talks about that Gen AI is so good at is summarization, right? So it can take what the words that you send and say, all right, what he means by these words is a command to the system to show all movies between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. tonight and turns it into an API call. And then you get a response either on a screen or via voice. So all those three things have to work together really well. And certainly the first two, and likely the last one as well, are made so much better by Gen AI. What I keep telling people is the Gen AI revolution, the way it's going to manifest itself for most people is voice, right? The ChatGPT next gen, their big announcement with the app was the app is now voice powered. And I think a lot of the work that they've been doing at OpenAI and otherwise is how to make the interface into Gen AI much more voice-based and voice-friendly. I asked Tobias, if we've been in the early stages of voice technology all along, what have we learned that will underpin the voice-first user interface revolution? In the sound of the future, Tobias makes the argument that voice is best used in multimodal experiences, meaning the interaction involves more than one type of communication. In this case, it involves voice and at least one other method of input or output. Voice in a multimodal environment is the fastest possible way that we can communicate to machines and they can communicate back to us. You have to have voice and screen concurrently. The reason we want to use voice at the end of the day is because it's so fast versus typing. Three times as fast as on a keyboard, five times as fast as on a mobile device. So we always are wanting to speak into our devices, but... It's also super slow to listen to transmissions and hard to remember what's going on versus a screen. The early applications have completely missed that and it goes all the way to the nomenclature we use. We call them smart speakers, which is entirely backwards. They should be smart mics. We want to be talking to them, not listening to them. Tobias gave an example that we might ask our voice assistant what movies are playing tonight. But what we don't want to hear back is... Questions for now. The movie in 3D plays at 5.45 p.m., 7.30 p.m., 9.45 p.m., 11.30 p.m. Questions for now. The movie in panoramic view plays at... You get the idea. What we want is to see that on a screen and then just say, get me two tickets to Star Wars at 8 p.m. because you're already authenticated, et cetera. And so once that paradigm evolves, voice will become the primary way that we transmit information to machines, not necessarily receive it. One of the mistakes that have been made in voice design is only relying on this concept of copying human conversation. There is a theory called the uncanny valley that was presented in Japan in the 1970s. It's been proven many, many times over that basically says the more human you make an experience without it actually being human, the more freaked out and less trusting the users get because we know it's not human and it's, it's kind of bugging us out. And so this is another reason why I think the multimodal approach is so important because if it's multimodal, the human being on the other side isn't 
comparing the experience to what a human conversation would be. Any new technology has this trust issue that it has to get through and voice hasn't crossed the trust issue because we didn't have multimodal. And once we break through that, we're going to be off to the races. So if voice technology has the potential to elevate the customer experience, what do brands need to do to prepare for a voice first future? Tobias advises listeners to think about where voice holds a distinct advantage over any other type of interaction a customer might have with your business. It all starts with looking at what does voice do better than other forms of communication and then map out literally every single process where customers or employees are interacting with the system and ask ourselves, all right, in any of these steps, do any of these voice cases apply? And if they do, can we use voice to make them more efficient? And really going through a very thoughtful process around how to do that. I think when we start doing that with clients, the breakthroughs are astounding and rapid. Like within a three to five day work session, we can identify literally hundreds of processes in a company that are going to be much, much more efficient using voice. Brett says that setting up a knowledge management system is one of the easiest actions brands can take, not just for self-service applications with voice technology, but also to improve the organization's capacity to solve problems and respond to inquiries. So for example, Morgan Stanley did it for their investment analysts, basically took 100,000 documents, 100,000 documents, like there's no one on staff that's read 100,000 documents, right? So they have 100,000 documents, but this is all useful information for their wealth managers. And now they can just ask it a question. What about this? Here's a situation, these three things, you know, what should I look at next? Or what might I suggest? Those types of things. What are the rules associated with these types of investments? So those are things that they would have to ask somebody, they would be sending email. And we go back to this idea of unknown unknowns. Like we don't know about them. They're out there. We've got this thing about known knowns. Like we know it, and we know where it is, but we also have these things like unknown knowns. Like nobody knows about this part of it. It's like the organization knows it, but the organization doesn't know it knows it or the people in the organization don't know that. So then they're just running around trying to find the answer to something when it's right there. And that's what some of these tools will be able to do. With any new paradigm shifting technology, there are important questions. For instance, will voice technology make some roles redundant? Tobias notes that much like the arrival of past technologies, some jobs will become obsolete, but other jobs will be created. It's just that the latter is more difficult to predict. We're starting to see the concept of a prompt engineer, right? That is a job that didn't exist before Gen AI. We're starting to see the job of a conversational designer, designing a conversation with the machine and how do you approach that, et cetera. So there will be a whole series of tech jobs that get created, but I don't think it's just tech jobs. What I think is going to happen is it's going to allow people to do the higher value part of their jobs. Another important consideration when leveraging voice technology is maintaining customer trust. Hallucinations and deepfakes are real concerns for businesses looking to integrate generative AI. But Tobias noted the value of partnerships to help address potential issues. Hallucinations are interesting because you kind of confront that in two different ways. One is by creating much more narrowly bounded voice and gen AI experiences, right? It's really hard to create a completely human experience without a hallucination sneaking in. But if you're saying, look, we're a banking app, we're gonna give you banking information. If someone starts asking about the weather, we're not gonna answer that. Whereas in a human to human, completely human assistant paradigm, you kind of have to answer those questions and you get off track. So A, you, brands have an advantage because they can narrowly bound the voice experience. And then second, there are techniques like using a second LLM to look at what the first LLM said and the chances of two LLMs making exactly the same error or having the exact same hallucination is very, very low. Same thing goes for voice authentication. Voice authentication on its own can get cracked, not 100% easily because there's ways to see what is a simulation, what's not. But then when you add two factor on like an eye scan or fingerprint scan or a pin or whatever it is, testing the phone number that the call is coming from, all of a sudden you can get to a very, very high degree of reliability. And so it's always looking at what the latest thinking is and the latest research. 
Brett stressed that with the customer expectation of trust and safety, brands need to ensure they're using deepfake detection and voice clone detection tools. But he also noted deepfake technology can be an opportunity for brands if it's used properly. You know, some are using it to like their CEO can give an address to the company and they can do it in eight languages, right? They do it because not to fool anybody, but it's just to make it easier for people to understand what's being conveyed in their native language from the CEO of the company. There's other things that people are doing from a creative standpoint with these technologies. So my number one advice is just get out there and do this. This is a learning by doing market. And the more you know, because you've done something, and it doesn't even have to be public, it just be internal. Then you'll understand where the opportunities are and where the potential risks are. You'll know better yourself. You won't just have to read about it. And then you'll be able to leverage it more effectively. I asked Tobias, if voice technology is the sound of the future, how far off is the future? I think we are in the middle of it. We are working with clients every day to voiceify their apps. And I think that's really where the, the change in thinking is happening. This isn't about building Alexa skills or something within Siri. Because no one knows, like if you're a Citibank customer, you don't know how to get to Citibank via Lexa or what it even does, right? But now you're going to start with the app because it's always there. You hit it with one tap and then you start speaking. That's the implementation most of us are going to see. And most of us are going to see it in 2024 and 2025 for most brands. And then it's going to get better and better and better. And it's going to become ubiquitous in the sense that most of the functions that we ask an app to do are going to be voice first. And then I think a decade from now, like 2030, 2035, something else amazing is going to happen, but this is going to be a long run. Brett also sees the rise of voice technology in the near future, but noted it might take a few years for people to start to use voice assistants more frequently. We live in an era where there's an onslaught of information, of requests, right? Everybody feels it. There's clutter in terms of information and there's an overwhelming avalanche of requests for our time, for our attention, whatever it might be, right? And there's a friend of mine who founded a company called Soul Machines. His name's Greg Cross. He's one of the co-founders and CEO. And for Synthedia, our generative AI focused publication and research service, we had a, an online conference and the title of his presentation was, the robots are coming and they're just in time. Because we've created a world where we need robots to help us navigate it. And I love that idea that they're just in time. And they're not only just in time, they're just, they're better faster than I thought they were going to be. And I'm the one who said that I thought there would be a million, you know, there's going to be a million assistants just by businesses. And I think very legitimately that's true today. If you just think about everybody who has even some sort of assistant type chatbot on their website or in the mobile app and things like that. But maybe I'll just do that here. I mean, I'm going to revise it. I'll say there's going to be a billion assistants. A voicebot.ai report highlighted that in 2021, 44% of consumers in the U.S. said they'd like to see a voice assistant capability within their mobile apps. As Tobias mentions, the brands that are leading the way are the ones who are able to find quick and easy ways to take a frustrating experience and make it a delightful one. I get asked a lot, well, what's the sign? Like, how will you know? that voice is starting to arrive in the way that you're talking about. And to me, it's that the apps that we use, whether they're apps for an employee to interface with a company or for us to interface with a brand as, as consumers, that there's a big mic button in the middle of an app or a part of an app. And that's the primary way we tell the app what to do. And when that happens, you'll know that voice has arrived. And a lot of times it's just the app doing something. Sometimes it might connect us to customer service, but great, now we're connected to customer service and customer service knows what we were trying to do in the app and that we're pre-authenticated, et cetera. So it takes so much friction out of the customer service experience. At TELUS International, Willow Tree together, that's what we're so excited about bringing to customers is this complete experience where all these different modalities are tied together and the, it's invisible to the customer what's going on in the background. They're just having this seamless, delightful experience. And a great start in leveling up your understanding of voice technology is the book Tobias wrote, The Sound of the Future. I asked Tobias who he wrote The Sound of the Future for and who needs to hear the message of the book the most. Anyone involved in leading businesses or organizations, they don't have to be business, it could be nonprofits. First of all, at the executive level, and secondly, in marketing and product and customer service, I think folks will find it incredibly illuminating and hopefully inspiring how voice is going to make their brands more effective in terms of dealing with consumers. 
On the employee side, I think it's senior HR executives, senior IT executives, really understanding the importance of getting going here. And I think that's really what I hope to inspire folks to put the book down and say, you know what, this is just like the internet was, and this is just like mobile was, this combination of AI and voice is a really, really big deal. And we have to start implementing it and at least coming up with MVPs, examples of where we're going to use this, testing it uh, very, very quickly, because it will be an opportunity to leapfrog some of our competition. You can find Tobias's book, The Sound of the Future, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and in thousands of local bookstores. And yes, it's also available as an audiobook. For a full list of retailers or to learn more about the book, visit tobiasdengel.com. We'll put a link in the podcast description as well. Thank you so much to Tobias Dengel and Brett Kinsella for joining me and sharing their insights today. And thank you for listening to Questions for Now, a TELUS International podcast. Be sure to follow Questions for Now on your podcast player of choice to be the first to hear the latest episodes as soon as they're released. I'm Robert Zirk, and until next time, that's all for now. Thank you.